Yes, so well, let me start thanking uh, the organizers. It's a great pleasure and a great honor to be here among all of you and in this very special way, place. Uh, so I also think, like many of you, that we're uh, living a very interesting moment. So we have now that experimentalists have been able to build machines that can do things that we cannot compute, that we are at the verge of uh, being not able to compute. And so my talk is going to go in that direction. So how we can use the devices that we have at the moment to, to, to learn maybe even how to do computations classically that we don't know how to do now, how, how to do, and but, but also how to learn physics and science in, in general. Um, so let, let me start with a problem that was uh, Put up, but by about put up by um, from computer scientists, and that's what is called quantum verification. So the idea here is, imagine that there is a quantum computer that some company has, and you want to use it on the web, on the cloud, and uh, so you would like to make sure that this person who is selling their uh, device, it has a quantum computer. So how do you check that indeed what you're paying for is a real quantum computer? And one idea would be, well, I mean, let's ask the, the, the provider to, to make a, a factorization, a very big factorization. Uh, however, this has two problems. So the first problem is that, as we heard from Matthias, it will take many, many years that, 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 that these, these quantum computers are able to do these factorizations. And the second one is that maybe this device that is there is doing very good factorizations. It's very good for factorizations, but it's not very good for doing quantum simulations. So that's why people in computer science uh, figure out some other ways of uh, checking this, uh, this problem. I mean, uh, checking that somebody has a quantum computer. But all of them require fault-tolerant quantum computations, so they are even more difficult uh, than, than factoring, factoring numbers. So there have been some proof-of-principle experiments by, by Chris on, on that. But we took a little bit more a physical approach there. And you will see what is the motivation behind that. So let me introduce what is the, what is the problem. And maybe mention also that it has a very surprising application that was also brought up by Scott Aronson. So you're able to check that somebody has a quantum computer, and you, want, you, you can certify that. And then this person can generate random numbers that are certified. So there are random numbers that you can believe that is not cheating. And there is no classical analog for that. So that's an application of quantum computation that it's not possible with classical, with classical devices. And that it's not a better algorithm or something else, just something that was a, came as a surprise. But anyway, so the, the problem is typically um, posed in the following way. So there is a verifier and a prover. So here they are not called Alice and Bob, they are called Arthur and Merlin. So Arthur is the verifier, the one, to, uh, is the one who wants to check that the other one has a quantum computer. And Merlin is a very powerful, so he has a quantum computer and wants to check that, uh, and, and, and wants to prove that uh, he has a quantum computer. So the proposal that we had for that is the following. So um, uh, Arthur gives a set of instructions to the prover how to prepare certain quantum states. And this quantum state is going to be a tensor network state, so called PEPs. And after the prover has prepared that state, or supposedly prepared that state, then Arthur is going to ask uh, to measure the qubits in different bases to measure the first sigma x, second sigma y, the third sigma x, sigma y, sigma c, give me the results. And then repeat it again, now measure that, measure that. So you're collecting all these statistics. And at the end, uh, when you have all these statistics, then Arthur is going to make some calculations, some classical calculations with a quantum computer that would verify that what has been done, it's impossible or it's very unlikely if this person didn't have a quantum computer and didn't prepare the state and uh, did the measurements in that, in that particular way. Of course, for that, I don't want to enter into details how, how this works, but um, so the key point is that what we had to develop in order to, to propose this, this, this method is that we showed that these tensor network states, there, there are many quantities that you can compute without having to prepare the state and that you can check if you give you some. So in other words, the prover can uh, compute certain things, but it's very difficult to create samples that have these expectation values that the verifier is able to compute. So this is uh, an interesting observation by itself, so that there are certain states, these uh, tensor networks, for which you can uh, know what are some expectation values without having to sample, without having to do any, any, any computation. Now, the, um, the, the, I mean, the weak part of that 
is that that's, it's very difficult to make, to make sure that this is secure. So maybe there is some uh, classical algorithm which is able to produce the same samples as if the prover had a quantum computer and that is doing the measurement. Uh, however, if this is true, then this would give us a way of doing classic, I mean, computations, classic, a new way of doing classical computations for making uh, calculations with these tensor network states which we don't know at the moment. So in other words, if some people are able to do these experiments and to, let's say, to, to, to do this quantum verification, then two things can happen. Either the people just poof this method and that's not uh, secure anymore, but if this happens, then this means that they will have to come up with a method for many body systems, let's say, for, for computing quantities that at the moment we don't know, or it's secure and then you will have a random number generator which is 35. Okay, so one requirement for that, and we will come back to that later on, is that uh, is the first step that I mentioned there. So, of course, it should be a method to, the, to, to, to give indications to prepare these PEPs efficient methods. So there should be, so you give me certain PEPs and I should be able to tell you how to prepare it with a quantum computer, with a quantum, quantum simulator. And so I'll come back to that later on. So let me tell you now another quantum algorithm that we developed a couple of years ago. Uh, so as you know, there are quantum algorithms to compute dynamics of physical systems. There are quantum algorithms to compute ground states for example, adiabatic algorithms, but there are not that many to compute properties at finite temperature, at finite energy. And so we, I mean, came up with a couple of, of methods. And so, uh, again, so the, the, the idea is that at very high temperatures, then, it's, uh, then you can do these comp computations with classical computers. We know at infinite temperature is, is trivial. And what one would expect is, depending on the problem, there is a temperature at which it becomes difficult below that temperature to do with classical computers, and there would be some temperature that would be difficult with a quantum computer, and uh, this temperature for quantum computer probably is much lower than the one of cla classical computers, so this means that there is a window of temperature in which quantum computers can help. And indeed, for physical problems, for problems that, 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 uh, that uh, I mean, we know that they're find interesting, like the ones that appear in condensed matter physics or in high energy physics, and it turns out that the, the quantum computers can go all the way down because the adiabatic algorithms work, work very well. And so what we, uh, we came up with with two algorithms, so the first one has an exponential quantum advantage, it solves the first problem, so the microcanonical, so it prepares, let's say, the states that are close to an eigenstate in, the, in whatever you want in the spectrum, and the second one it's uh, it's uh, it solves the second problem. It is a canonical expectation values of observables for canonical distribution, and so what it does is that it takes the classical method, which is called quantum Monte Carlo, and uh, circumvents the design problem. So it uses the quantum computer as a subroutine to a classical method to avoid the problem that this classical method has. And so I will not tell you so much about what uh, how does it work. Just a, a brief idea, and uh, so. For example, that's the first problem in which you're, uh, you're, uh, what you would like to do is to compute some expectation value of some observable around some energy, energy eigenstate. So you're giving some, let's say, precision delta, and then you would like to take one state that is within this precision delta, and you would like to compute some expectation value. And uh, the way the algorithm works is first prepare a state which has that energy, and so of course for that you will need to be able to, to prepare that state. Um, and the second one, of course, the, the state uh, will not be an eigenstate, so we'll have a certain width in energies, we'll have certain uncertainty variance in energies. So the second step is just in the way that we filter light and to have one color also here, you would like to make these widths narrower and narrower and narrower until the desired width. And once you have that, then you have a state in which you measure the observable, you repeat it many times, and at the end you get the expectation value. And so for doing this uh, spectral filtering, so what you can do is to do a kind of Fourier transform. So you start with some initial state, you go for different times, then you compute the expectation value for different times, and at the end you sum all that, and then the, 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 the result is as if you would have prepared this state at this, at this energy. And so what I want to point out is that in order to run this algorithm, as well as the other algorithm, they, you need two ingredients, so you have to be able to prepare a state at low energy or sufficiently low energy, and those states could be, for example, tensor network states, and then you should be able to measure uh, Loschmidt echoes, or Loschmidt amplitude. 
And so you see the first requirement is the same as we had before, prepare states, prepare certain states, and the second one is to measure uh, loss meet amplitudes. And uh, this, you have the formula there, this A of T or B of T, these are the kind of quantities. If you start with some initial state, involved with a Hamiltonian, and check if you ended up with the same state. And so now what I will tell you is some algorithms to solve these two problems, to prepare a state efficiently and to measure loss meet echoes. And so we have been working a lot on state preparation, so how to prepare now efficiently uh, states and so so one one method that we proposed already some time ago it just uh, requires to take in two dimensions a lattice in two dimensions and act on plaquettes one after each other and in this way you can create uh, a subclass of these tensor network states and this subclass includes all topological string net states and and so on and the scale so the the computational time in order to do this preparation with the sequential generation case like the number of lattice size that you have to the power one divided by the uh, spatial dimension. So for example, for two dimensions is the square root of n. Another method which is more efficient is adiabatic uh, preparation. So I mean, uh, so you are given one of the states that you want to prepare. Then we always know that there is some Hamiltonian for which they are the ground state. And so what you can do is to try to connect this Hamiltonian with some other Hamiltonian for which you can prepare the state very efficiently and then try to prepare it adiabatically. The problem that you have in practice is that you may go through some crossing, in which case the adiabatic theorem will not work. And so what we did there is that we showed that for this case there is no crossing and actually there is always a gap. And this is why you should be able to prepare the state efficiently. And then you can show that actually the scaling, the, poly, the, the time that, uh, that it takes in order to prepare those states, this case like a, a logarithm of n, so it's exponentially more uh, faster than, than the second one. So the third method is based on measurement. So now this is, if you have a, a quantum simulator or quantum computer to prepare those states and you just prepare it just by evolution, but if you have access to measurement and it turns out that you can prepare it much faster. So there's some states which will require a time that is proportional to n, they are not in, the, in this, uh, this adiabatic. However, if you can do measurements and react with respect to the measurements can be uh, created in a time which is one, is independent of the size. So you just evolve a little bit, make some measurement, and depending on the outcome of the measurement, you apply some local gates, and then you prepare the state. And in fact, those states like the GHC state or the W state, some topological states can be prepared in that particular way. And so actually what we also did is that for now matrix product state, which is a class of tensor network states, then we showed that without measurements, the time that it requires to prepare the state has to scale log n, like the logarithm of the number of particles. It cannot be faster. And then we have an algorithm which is optimal, so we re which, which takes this log n. And what we show also is that if you have measurements that any matrix product state can be prepared in a time which is log, log n. So there is an exponential now speed up, let's say you have measurements as uh, compared to the case in which you don't have measurements. Okay, so this was the, the first part that we needed for the two uh, algorithms that I mentioned before, to prepare states sufficiently fast. Now the second one, you should be able to measure loss with amplitude. So in general, that's the formula. So there is some initial state that you can prepare. There is some let's say, evolution Hamiltonian that you can implement with your system, either analog or digital. And then there is some state that you have to, uh, in which is easy to measure, for example, a product state doing microscopy. And then you would like to compute that quantity. And it's clear that this quantity, I mean, the absolute value of this quantity can be relatively easily measured because you just start with your initial state, then you evolve, and then you just make a big picture of your final state, and then you compare with the state uh, that you wanted to have. You, if this is the state that you wanted to have, the psi one, then you uh, assign a one, and if not a zero, repeat it many times, compute the average, and this will give you the absolute value square of that quantity. However, the phase is what is, what is very difficult. And, uh, and so now, there exist some ways of measuring the phase. Actually, there is one that was uh, proposed many years ago by, by Arthur Recker and some other people, which appears not only in this, in this, in this uh, algorithm that I mentioned before. It's part of many quantum algorithms. It's called Hadamard test. And in the Hadamard test, it's an interferometric uh, measurement. So the idea is that you have an extra qubit, an auxiliary qubit. And now you prepare this auxiliary qubit in a superposition of 0 plus 1. And then you evolve your system with 
if the state of your oscillator is zero, you, you don't evolve your system. And if the state of your system is one, then you evolve your system with your whole Hamiltonian. And at the end, you measure your auxiliary, uh, uh, auxiliary uh, qubit. And you compute the expectation value of these measurements. And this will give you the phase, not only the, the amplitude. And I mean, this is, this is very good. However, it requires non-local interactions. It requires that you evolve your whole system control depending on the state of a single qubit. And that's, that's very difficult. And uh, unless you have all-to-all -all interactions and, uh, three, and three ball interactions and things like that, but typically for analog quantum simulators and even for uh, digital quantum computers, if you have some locality, that's very difficult that one qubit uh, uh, and, and, and has some, some overhead. So in fact, the algorithm that I mentioned before for finite temperature to compute com uh, quantities at finite temperature was, uh, was implemented by Continuum. With 32 qubits. And uh, I mean, the bottleneck, what they had was exactly that they were using this Halama test. And then they had to do every time that they want to do some proterization, some evolution, they had to look at the qubit, do some gate, some throw gate, interact so back, back and, and things like that. So this was a big overhead. And so that's why we were thinking about several methods to, to get rid, to get around this problem. And just mentioned here, one of them is using complex analysis. So that's, uh, I mean, just basically to uh, the undergraduate studies and complex analysis. And looking at the at the at the form at the formula of the of this uh, Lochschmidt uh, echo, you see that if you look at the time and you com you, you replace the time by a complex <laughs> by a complex uh, uh, variable, then this is analytic. And then using something like uh, uh, kramers kronigs relation, then there is a way of of computing this quantity. And uh, so, I mean, th there is no ancilla, no locality, so they're very advantages, and we compare now quantitatively. So uh, th then th there is an advantage with respect to the other method. So um, now I want to go to the uh, last part of my talk and want to talk about errors in quantum simulation. So this is a, a lot of discussion about that. And so I want to now see, uh, so how errors uh, uh, affect quantum simulation. And the important thing is that in quantum simulation, the errors are extensive. So you have atoms in optical lattices, then in each lattice size, there will be an error. So the total number of errors will be n, will be proportional to n. Or the error, let's say Hamiltonian that you have there, is proportional to something small, epsilon, times n, because there are n terms. And you talk to computer scientists, and they, they tell you, and they have told me, that it's impossible that quantum simulation will ever work. Because after a time, one over n, then the system, the state that you have will be orthogonal to the ideal one, and therefore you'll have a completely different. But actually, that's, that's not true, and that's very well known by, by physicists, and you just have to look at experiments like the one of Immanuel uh, many years ago, in which you look at the Hamiltonian that they had, they had the, Hamil the boss tower Hamiltonian, and the error was, was large. I mean, was it 20% or 10% times n, where he has, I don't know, hundreds, thousands, millions of atoms, so this number was big. And in the, in, even though the state is completely orthogonal to the ideal one, when you measure observables, then it turns out that this, time, this, this factor of n cancels. So you look at intensive quantities, then it does it not depend on n. And so what we have tried to do is to formalize that. And so we don't have time to explain that, but you say you have a model, Hamiltonian, that you want to simulate. Now you have some error, it's extensive, but you're looking at observables. And we would like to know when there errors in intensive quantities will be intensive independent of n. This is what we call stable problems. And so we will be able to prove that for most interesting problems, these are stable. So this means that for these problems, then quantum uh, simulation with errors will still give you some, some reasonable results. But um, what is um, perhaps more interesting is now, if you want to see if a quantum simulator would be um, uh, um, useful, useful in practice, then you can, some of the problems that people try to solve in quantum simulators is to compute an expectation value not as a function of the system size, because you are interested in the thermodynamic limit, for example. So the scaling as a function of the system size is not what makes sense now as a question in this problem. So the right question should be, so what is the effort that I have to make? So what is the computational time? If I want to get one uh, uh, a precision in my observable in the thermodynamic limit, which is epsilon. So we would like to know what is the computational time as a function of 1 over epsilon. Now compare the classical computer and the quantum computer. And so maybe one scales like exponential of 1 over epsilon, and the other one is polynomial of 1 over epsilon, in which there would be a, an exponential advantage. But not only that, because if you have now errors in your, in your, in your quantum simulator, 
What this means in practice is that your quantum simulator will not be able to give you the exact solution. It will give you an error in this expectation while in the thermodynamic limit. So what you would like to know is what is the classical computational time? How does it scale with the error that I have in my hardware? In other words, if you have a problem like simulating the dynamics or simulating the low temperature behavior of a system, and you do it with a quantum simulator, and you obtain a number because you have certain errors, and now there is a classical algorithm that is able to reproduce this number with the same error. Now, you improve by a factor of 10 your hardware, so what will be now the computational time in a classical computer, how it will increase to get now this factor of 10? And it turns out that they're exponential, I mean, depending on the problem, then you can get exponential speed ups or super polynomial speed ups, or in other words, just, I mean, exaggerating a little bit, if I decrease, the error of my hardware, so for example, my T in the Hubbard model of my U by a factor of 10, then the computational time in a classical computer would be the computational time to the power of 10. It's exponential, the computational time in dimensional units, like right? the number of, of, of gates that you, you have to do. So that's how I, one way in which I think that it makes sense to talk about the, the, the advantage of quantum simulation. So it refers to how, what is the effort of a classical computer to catch up with improvement in the experiment. So I wanted to talk a little bit about quantum chemistry, but I don't have time. And so I would like to thank you for your attention.